Do you ever think about what made you who you are as an individual? Say your personality, are you shy? Mental health and illness, do you get depressed often? Cognitive abilities, how well did you do at school? When you think about it, you usually think of things like your upbringing, your school, your friends. These are all things that you can see and feel. But what I'm going to be talking about is something that you can't experience directly, DNA. So what I'm going to be telling you about today is that um, about my book and its basic message is that inherited DNA sequences are the major systematic source making us who we are as individuals. And the first part of my talk is about why DNA matters. And then the second part is about the DNA revolution. The book is the culmination of my 45 years of research trying to understand the genetic and environmental sources of differences between individuals. And after 45 years of research, I've come to this conclusion. It's stated a bit provocatively here, but that DNA is the major systematic force making us who we are as individuals. The word systematic is important. This research says that environment is very important as well, but the environment works very differently from the way we thought it worked. It's not systematic. So that's why I end up concluding inherited DNA differences, which is what I mean by genetics, is the major systematic force making us who we are as individuals. And when I was in graduate school 45 years ago, environmentalism, the view that we are what we learn, so dominated psychology, genetics was not even mentioned. You could look at textbooks of that time in the 70s and look up schizophrenia, and you'd be told it's caused by what your mother did to you in the first few years of life. And genetics wasn't ever mentioned. So after 40, four decades of research, most scientists have come to conclude that gen there's a lot of evidence for the importance of genetics. Most people understand what you mean when you say something's heritable. We're talking about individual differences. We're not talking about innate instincts or something. We're talking about why you're different from other people. So eye color. Is eye color heritable? I've done lots of surveys and, you know, people are pretty close to the truth that it's almost completely heritable, meaning the differences in whether you have green eyes or blue eyes is largely due to what you inherit. No problem there. Um, but when you get to complex traits, say like weight, other people who think there are no genetic influences on weight. No one's admitting to that anyway. And 50, well, it's good. Most people guess on average in populations, it's about 30, 40% is what people think, but they're underestimating genetic influence by half. And again, what this means is of the difference between us and weight, about 60, 70% of the differences are due to inherited DNA differences. And that's really important because, you know, in this fat shaming world of ours, people like me who always have problems with weight, putting it on too easily, finding it too hard to take it off, um, you know, you think, just pull up your socks, willpower. Yeah, that's great for you skinny people. But, you know, for some people in a fast food nation where you're bombarded with food cues, it's easier said than done. You know, just in a weak moment, you just eat what's around. You don't notice it, that sort of thing. So it is important to recognize that most of the differences between people for weight are due to inherited DNA differences. That's in the populations we study. So I'll tell you in a minute, there's a lot of caveats here. And what about school achievement? You know, an even more complex trait. 20, yeah. I mean, most people, the average estimate in a population would be 30%. So that was great to hear that because the answer is about 60% of the differences between kids. In school achievement from the earliest school grades to GCSEs and A levels, about 60% of the differences are due to inherited DNA differences. And that's huge. You know, it's not 100%, but in the behavioral sciences, if we explain 5% of the variance, that's amazing. So explaining 60% of the variance is really extraordinary, especially when the field of education totally ignores genetics. You don't read anything about genetics in textbooks other than, you know, really rare single gene disorders, which as a teacher you'd never see anyway. So uh, this is the most misunderstood concept in genetics, heritability. So we know what we mean when we say heritable, eye color, weight, school achievement. We're talking about differences between people. But you scratch the surface of what people know, and they really don't get it. So it's worth a minute or so 
explaining what we mean by heritability. We're talking about differences between people. So when we say weight is heritable, we don't mean, say if it's 70% heritable, we don't need, I'm American, so I still am afraid I do pounds, but my 250 pounds, I, it doesn't mean that, you know, 200 pounds came from my genes and the other 50 pounds were added by the environment. It sounds silly, but you'd be surprised. You scratch the surface of what people know, and that's what they think. Nothing to do with one individual. We're talking about a population and why people in the population differ from each other, which is a completely different issue. And it's a... Um, you know, we have 3 billion base pairs of DNA and this double helix of DNA, 3 billion. And 99% of them are identical for all of us. So we can now sequence DNA and you find 99% were exactly the same. That's what makes us human. The 1% that differs, though, we can say doesn't make a difference. And that's what we're doing here. We're saying of the differences in any trait, you know, from weight to school achievements, schizophrenia, alcoholism, to what extent do the inherited DNA differences, that 1% of DNA, make a difference in a particular trait we want to study? And I'll be focusing on behavioral traits because I'm a psychologist. But we could say the same thing. We could do a talk on medical. It'd be basically the same issue. And there's several important caveats here. First is that we're describing a particular population. So I do studies of all the twins born in England and Wales. That's the population we study. We can only talk about describing the genetic and environmental influences on this population with its mix of genetic and environmental influences. We're not talking about what could be. We're not saying in some other culture, in some other time, in some other imaginary world, what could happen. Anything could happen. We're talking about what is rather than what could be. And second, we're talking about the normal range of variation, which is all we can study. So in our twin studies, we probably have 95% of the population. We study these kids from birth through birth records. But you could well imagine a very abusive parent, for example, wouldn't participate in the study, even though we, we get most of the range. But we can only study what we study. We're describing what is. Similarly, we're not, a, we're not studying the extremes of genetic variation. So there are, most single gene mutations are rare, fortunately. And on average, maybe one in 50,000, one in 200,000. So even in our sample of 10,000 pairs of twins, you just don't get much of that. So they don't account for much. Okay. So the point here is we're studying individual differences in a population rather than one individual. And we're saying on average in that population, how much is weight due to inherited DNA differences and how much due to the environment? Even though the environment's varying wildly, some people like me are constantly on diets until we're not. And, you know, and there's all sorts of environmental variation out there in terms of your diets. So a lot more to say about all of these things, but I'll just tell you a bit about some of the methods that have been used to estimate how important genetics is. So a century old method is the twin method. It's like a biological experiment. I'm, I'm sure everyone knows there are two types of twins, identical and non-identical twins. So 1% of all births are twins. And a third of those are what we call identical or mono zygotic in their, it's a, uh, a separately, an egg that's fertilized with sperm, that zygote then, sometimes, we don't know why, splits in two. Those two zygotes are genetically identical. They have the same DNA information. So that's why we, they are clones. And the other type of twin is like any brother and sister who happen to be conceived at the same time. So very often women have more than one egg that comes down and gets fertilized. So like any brother and sister, they're 50% similar genetically. And, you know, they, they're also born in the same womb at the same time. So they're a good control for identical twins. So it's like a, a natural quasi-experiment. It's not experimental in the sense we don't randomly assign kids to be identical or non-identical twins. But if a trait is influenced by genetics, you'd have to predict that the identical twins will be more similar than the fraternal twins because they're twice as similar genetically. You can use the extent to which identical twins are more similar than fraternal twins to estimate heritability. So if a trait were 100% heritable, like height almost is, it's like 90% heritable, you'd expect identical twins to be almost identical and non-identical twins not to be zero, but to be more like 50% or in this case, 45%. 
So that suggests there's a lot of heritability. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.